Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading for a March 2022 finale. <laughs> I guess I could call it a Tuesday read uh, for the 29th, but eh. <laughs> I usually only make uh, three AM reading videos a month, and I've already made my three, but uh, the way that I went through my reading this month, uh, there's a couple of books uh, that I'm in the middle of now, or just finished, uh, that I didn't talk about at all earlier this month. I think largely because I did my AM readings uh, starting earlier in the month than my usual. So uh, I uh, wasn't able to cover everything that uh, I'm reading in, in March, which uh, is a lot. I'm hoping to get through 10 books total, which is fun. But anyway, uh, I thought, uh, why not just squeeze in a really quick video to talk about them here? Uh, hopefully much shorter than my usual for these things. In fact, I won't even read a short story from uh, the Dorothy Parker collection I've been reading from uh, since May in all of my AM reading videos. I just feel like this is like a special off-the-cuff one. <laughs> but maybe I will bog you down a little bit, uh, and instead of a Dorothy Parker reading, uh, I'll share some photos of cherry blossoms. Uh, I live in the D.C. area, and uh, the start of spring here uh, coincides with uh, the blooming, uh, the peak bloom of the cherry blossoms uh, from the trees that uh, were graciously gifted by the Japanese government uh, back uh, over a hundred years ago now. Oh, well, the first batch was, and there were more later. Uh, and planted around the tidal basin and downtown around some of the monuments. Uh, and it's just such a huge tourist attraction. And in fact, my aunts uh, came in from Kansas, uh, and I saw them in person for the first time in a few years since COVID. And uh, they actually uh, planned their trip uh, deliberately uh, to uh, coincide with the peak bloom. They were going to come a little later for my aunt's birthday, but then I, <laughs> I emailed them with the official uh, peak bloom uh, prediction uh, for when uh, the trees would be in bloom, because it's not for that long. And they were able to change their plans, and they just came last weekend, and we went down, and it was a lot of fun, and I thought... Uh, it was a nice day too, uh, you know, weather-wise. It was actually a pretty decent day, uh, followed by a couple of cold days, so we were lucky there. And I thought I'd share a few pictures with you now. Okay, now on to the books. Uh, I started by um, reading two books at the top of my Goodreads TBR that I put there in 2017, and it's my resolution this year to knock those ones off. So here I go. The first book I want to talk about is The Fallback Plan by Lee Stein, which was published a little over 10 years ago, and I think it it, it features a uh, protagonist, uh, Esther, who's roughly the same age as uh, Lee Stein and I am. And it's about her uh, shortly after her uh, college graduation. She's in a state of malaise, really. She'd uh, gotten a, a theater degree, although actually um, she had a bit of a breakdown in her last uh, semester of college and so kind of exited ignobly, you know, and finished her degree like, uh, you know, offline, as it were, or, you know, remotely. Um, and since then, she uh, basically has no plan. She's moved back in with her parents, aka the fallback plan, uh, and doesn't know uh, quite uh, what she wants to do next. Uh, and then her mother uh, finds her a uh, babysitting job with a recently uh, some recently bereaved neighbors whose uh, baby uh, tragically died in her crib uh, a, a little while before. Uh, and so she starts uh, babysitting, uh, pers uh, <laughs> technically speaking. Uh, the mother of uh, the four-year-old girl she's babysitting actually doesn't leave the house and is uh, frenetically working on an art project in her, uh, in her attic, which is supposed to be, you know, a method of healing. Uh, and she's just, she's sort of like an emotional tornado. And the father is largely distant, and then uh, Esther ends up having a uh, 
different sort of relationship with him, which uh, doesn't quite go into an affair, but kind of gets close to that, actually. But I think it really is supposed to be um, a meditation on uh, what this grief uh, does to people. And, of course, we also get uh, Esther's relationship with uh, the little girl, May. Uh, and it is sort of a, you know, fake problems, quote-unquote, meets real problems, except I think that's a little unfair to what Esther is going through, uh, some real, uh, you know, after effects of depression and uh, dealing with her own demons, I think, about uh, what to do next in life when uh, the uh, path is uh, before her is uncertain. Uh, so I feel like, you know, on its surface, there's this snarky sort of attitude, almost like Lena Denham's girls. Uh, but I feel like uh, ultimately what uh, Esther goes through with the Browns, this uh, family that she's babysitting for, is a little deeper than that. And she really has insights about uh, grief and about uh, some of the uh, foibles of growing up uh, from her recollections of her time growing up and then also what she is experiencing with May and uh, with the parents. So I feel like there's something deeper and more meaningful here than it might appear on the surface. There is a little bit of attention, I think, given to this sort of plot line that I don't think really is worth it. Uh, Technically, this is one of my uh, Jewish Book Council books with a nominally Jewish family, uh, and that comes in a little bit. Uh, weirdly, some of the stoner guys, loser guys Esther hangs out with, there's like some, I guess, uh, passive anti-Semitism that they, like microaggressions and well, aggression aggressions they take part in, which otherwise, you know, doesn't seem like Esther deals with in other places. Um, and uh, Esther decides she wants to write a screenplay, which is really just sort of a lazy... Uh, at least in this book, a really lazy retelling of the Chronicles of Narnia meets some sort of uh, Jewish uh, save Hanukkah uh, uh, motif, uh, almost like Herschel and the Hanukkah goblins uh, got mixed up in there too. Uh, and I don't really think that added much to the story. Uh, but other than that, I think uh, this was a pretty decent book. Uh, and since uh, this book came out over 10 years ago, Lee Stein's been busy. I actually Sometimes I go to podcasts and I type in author names to see if what interviews come up, and the only interviews I found were for later books. Uh, so I'll link down below. She wrote a memoir, actually, about coming to terms with an abusive uh, relationship in her life. And then one of her more recent books uh, is actually a, a satire of, like, girl boss culture and, like, companies like Goop like the health industry sort of thing. Uh, and that sounded uh, really interesting uh, from the interview. So I'll link those two uh, videos down below. I don't know if I will be reading any more Lee Stein because there is so much to read, but uh, I feel like there's more here than meets the eye. This next book I'm uh, much uh, more near the beginning of, and I think it's going to be my overlay book that I'll finish up in April. Uh, I'm talking about Your Mouth is Lovely by Nancy Richler. And this is a historical fiction book uh, that takes place uh, in the, uh, well, the Russian Empire slash right as it's really uh, t turning over into, uh, you know, the Bolshevik Re Re Revolution and the USSR and all of that. Uh, we are following uh, a Jewish character uh, whose name is Miriam. Uh, she grew up uh, in a, like, small uh, Belarusian little town. Uh, and we're tracking, like, her upbringing. She's being uh, brought up by her sort of uh, brusque uh, stepmother. She had a, a lot of tragedy in her backstory. Miriam did, I should say. Uh, well, I think the stepmother might, too. But Miriam's uh, mother uh, drowned herself in grief over the uh, death of her firstborn son. And, like, there's a lot of... There's some superstition in town about, like, you know, the the soul of the dead boy, like, you know, luring his mother away and... Miriam was raised for six years, like, uh, by her wet nurse, and then her father remarried and uh, awkwardly, you know, uh, reintroduced Miriam to his household, although he doesn't seem to have much to do with her at all. It's mostly these about uh, Miriam's relationship with uh, her uh, stepmother, who is a uh, wedding dressmaker. I think there's a better word for that, but anyway... <laughs> Although that stuff is uh, sort of backstory in a way. Well, it's, it's the crux of the story, but it starts in media res because uh, 10 years later, Miriam is a prisoner in Siberia, uh, pr I believe because she takes place at, uh, part in uh, anti-imperial, um, you know, activities against uh, the empire. 
And uh, already the book is getting into particularly the Jewish spin of uh, what's going on uh, in Jewish culture in uh, the Russian Empire around that time. There's like different factions of people that uh, even those in the, you know, Tevya the Dairyman uh, type uh, Anna Tevkas uh, know about. Uh, we have radicals uh, who are looking for change, like the Bundists who want to sort of overthrow the government and stay in, in Russia, and then the Zionists who, uh, you know, are looking at, you know, all the centuries of anti-Semitism and saying, we've got to get out of here. There's just, you know, no hope for us in a non-Jewish homeland. Uh, and then the religious uh, who are trying to hold on to tra 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 traditions in various ways, even though the world is largely changing around them, too. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interesting history in here, and I think uh, the characters are compelling so far, but one thing I am interested in, I've always been interested in this history, but actually I recently did some Ancestry.com research on my own family and uh, did something I been meaning to do for years really is which is to track down my mother's family to see you know when they came to the US uh, and uh, that's pretty much as far as I could go with that so far you know most of the records I find in ancestry are like US census records and that sort of thing but anyway you know my mother's family has been largely a mystery we don't know that much specifically about uh, older generations but I was able through these documents to at least track down where all of my uh, Jewish ancestors and when, or at least when they came to America and roughly where, although the roughly where is the uh, Russian Empire and oftentimes I don't know more than that, but for my uh, great-grandfather's parents, they came from Minsk, from Belarus, uh, well, you know, which was then the Russian Empire because they immigrated around the time that this book is taking place. The, the book starts in the 1880s and like moves into the 1910s. Uh, and that's around the time that uh, members of my uh, great-grandparents' father's uh, family were moving from Minsk to, well, actually to Missouri, <laughs> uh, is where they uh, ended up. And so that uh, does give this uh, an extra layer of uh, interest for me and uh, hoping uh, that uh, this book continues to hold up. And the final book I'll talk about here is an audio book. This is If Tomorrow Comes by Nancy Kress. This is book two in her uh, Yesterday's Kin trilogy. Uh, I read the first uh, book or listened to it on audio and talked about it in an earlier Friday Reads video, <laughs> Friday Reads video uh, this month. And I decided uh, I wanted to continue along with uh, the series. Uh, this is a science fiction series taking place in the near future. In book one, uh, the Earth has had our first alien contact with aliens who uh, come to Earth, and I won't spoil uh, too much about them, but uh, they come to Earth uh, and try to work with us to uh, create a vaccine against this uh, spore cloud that's going to come to Earth uh, and, uh, you know, po possibly decimate uh, the population. So I found it really interesting <laughs> to read uh, some decently hard science, I think, uh, taking like a lot of the main characters are scientists uh, looking for a vaccine, you know, in desperate, uh, you know, time constraints because of this oncoming onslaught, which I feel like, you know, these books are a couple of years old, but it has special meaning now, <laughs> understanding, uh, you know, that sort of uh, time crunch and severity. Uh, and so this next book uh, takes place uh, 10 years uh, after uh, the aliens leave, uh, and they also bring um, some uh, Earthlings along with them uh, at that time, including the son of one of the main characters, Dr. Marianne Jenner. Uh, and uh, the story on Earth in book one continues, you know, we go through some after effects that, you know, the human population doesn't die off, but there are a lot of... Uh, both economic and ecological effects to these spores and yada yada. Uh, also, the uh, aliens left behind uh, plans for making a ship to follow them and to, you know, meet up again in the future. So book two is about that meetup, as it were. Well, we have two human ships going to this planet that the uh, aliens call World and the uh, Earthlings have started to call Kindred. Uh, the two um, ships, uh, one is a Russian ship, and uh, the Russians have uh, vengeance on the mind because actually uh, the spores uh, affected uh, Russians most significantly. 
that they had a lot of uh, people die from uh, exposure uh, because of uh, genetics and science and things. Uh, and so they want revenge and they're blaming uh, the aliens for the spores because, you know, the aliens came around the same time and it's sort of, you know, that emotional, non-rational response to tragedy. Uh, and then the other ship is an American uh, ship that's uh, coming, uh, you know, more in a sense of uh, diplomacy, although they do bring, you know, a military presence on the ship with them. So, uh, and uh, the thing about world is, is that it's a rather homogeneous culture. And so the understanding is, is that it's, uh, you know, there's not a lot of conflict and not, not, they don't even have their own standing army or anything. So it's a little bit of overkill, and, you know, but we are who we are uh, as humans on earth. <laughs> uh, so we're dealing with that. Uh, there's, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, conflict and tragedy and uh, already the Russians have uh, attacked cities, you know, from the skies and caused huge devastation. And meanwhile, their spores are now coming for, uh, for this planet and uh, for world slash kindred and we're kind of in the same mess again where uh, we desperately need a vaccine and uh, there actually isn't uh, much of um, much progress on that front so I was actually looking on Goodreads at some reviews and I saw Britta Bowler uh, reviewed uh, these books maybe that's where I heard about them from uh, and she called book two a bit of a repeat of book one and certainly the you know, quest for a vaccine thing uh, seems, you know, like a repeat. Although in today's society, again, I feel like we could do this story again. It feels like something we have to do multiple times to get it right. Uh, but otherwise, it's, I think, a story about culture clashes, but on an alien planet. Uh, and in that way, you know, I'm being weird, I guess, because science fiction is about, you know, taking leaps of faith with how to describe extraterrestrial life. <laughs> so, you know, to sit here and say it doesn't sound believable, I should be, like, giving her more flack than that, really, because the whole point of speculative and science fiction is, you know, to be able to, you know, stretch her imagination some. And I find it interesting to a point, uh, the, the, you know, the uh, culture stuff, although actually the culture I don't think is at least understanding the world culture isn't too much in frame. It's more about the clashes uh, with Earth. Uh, but we do get a reunion with uh, between uh, Mary and Jenner and her son, so there's that. I also do think there's something about the time time things that I I think I think that Nancy Cress uh, me messed up. Although I don't I haven't seen anybody else point this out. I have. Although I don't want to read too many reviews too closely for spoilers, but I haven't seen anything pointing this out, but I think she messed up some timing thing. Because apparently what happens with the ships is that there's some sort of time warp that happens so that 14 years pass uh, without anyone knowing <laughs> at first that they have passed uh, when you take the uh, uh, journey from uh, Earth to kindred slash world. Uh, so we have these humans uh, that uh, disappeared for us 10 years ago on the alien ship, but if they went through this time warp, they should now be 24 years older than the new Earthlings who came just now because the new Earthlings left 10 years later and then there was a 14 year time jump. So the new, so the old humans should have aged 14 years, but instead they, uh, 24 years, instead they've only aged 10 years. So I feel like she she messed something up there. Uh, uh, although, I don't know, I shouldn't get too deep into the timey-wimey stuff, I suppose. I'll, I only understand it when a DeLorean is involved. <laughs> so yeah, that's where I am now, uh, and I hope to uh, be finishing uh, this book sometime before the end of the month, and I'll be reviewing it and reviewing these other two books and uh, getting out my uh, March literary newsletter sometime in the beginning of April and then I will share it with you in my next AM reading video. So that about covers it for me now. Hopefully I've kept things kind of short and sweet or shorter and sweeter than most of my uh, AM reading videos anyway. <laughs> The uh, one uh, reading project I didn't mention much is uh, the Book 2 prize reading that I'm doing, although I 
held up all of my booktube prize books on my am reading videos but now i'm in the crunch time and my ballot is due uh tomorrow so uh i'm still trying to finish up a book and uh, get that out but i promise i will make the deadline i know this is a stressful time for robert who is our director and has to wrangle us all and make sure he gets all the votes in because uh on friday he'll be be announcing uh the octafinals winners or you know the ones that'll be uh, advancing to the next round i should say so that'll be very exciting also exciting in an, an anticipatory way, uh, expect me back on this channel within the next couple of days to do my March 2022 book haul. <laughs> there is always so much to read and so little time in which to do it. <laughs> so anyway, thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.